this moment, during the famous International Horse Show in Aachen, Germany, attention is centered on one horse, a golden Palomino. He and his rider are a part of the United States equestrian team, competing against many of the world's best horses and riders. This is the last place one might expect to find a horse with a Western brand on his jaw. Working against the clock, the pair head into the towering obstacles before them. By all the rules and logic of horse breeding, this Palomino from the western rangeland of the United States should be almost anywhere else but here. And yet he is holding his own against all competitors. The crowd has learned to watch the Palomino's flashing tail, for it is the barometer of his jumping. The higher the tail goes, the higher he jumps. This is his trademark. The course is a demanding one, but the golden horse seems to gather strength from some hidden wellspring of power. Not the power of a hot-blooded thoroughbred, but a power that had its beginning on that far-off western range. And although the golden horse from the United States has earned the admiration of the spectators, he was originally bred to be a cow horse, not a jumper. How did he get so far from home? Where did it all start? In the beginning, it was unfenced range in New Mexico and a six-day-old colt. His dam wore the jaw brand of the South Springs Ranch. Life was a new and exciting succession of days filled with wonder and experimentation, all under the watchful eye of his mother. Here at her side was the focal point of his life his haven of security. But part of her function was to teach and guide, for there are obstacles to be overcome in life. At six months, with the harsh winter at hand, he was brought in from the rain. He wore the long, shaggy coat that nature provided to protect him from the cold. In the spring, he shed the heavy winter coat, and he was turned loose to run the range again. soon earned him the name Injun Joe. There was corn here, intended for the Indian's livestock. But for a bold, inquisitive colt, this never presented any real problem. Until the day some young bucks plotted a counterattack.
This was a story to be told and retold. A legend in the making. The story of Injun Joe, the yellow coat with the invisible wings. One day, Injun Joe, now in his third year, was driven from the range into the ranch corral. The cowboy singled him out of the herd. Injun Joe and man had gotten along pretty well, and he was prepared to be reasonable. But this was something else again. Suddenly, he and the man were on a different footing. There was a tenseness in the air, like a gathering storm, as the business of saddling the colt went on. You don't just walk up to a bronc that's never been ridden. If you're smart, you use the protection of the pickup horse and slither down onto the hurricane deck. With everything set, Injun Joe was turned loose but the explosion never came. Injun Joe was a false alarm, a dog. <laughs> Throw him out. But the cowboy had an answer for that. He swung a spur, lit the fuse, and the blast off came. cowboy that couldn't be thrown, or a horse that couldn't be rode. But this was the day he learned he could fight back. Still, there were enough cattle, enough time, and enough work so that Injun Joe was broken to be a cow horse. And the memory of the earlier roughing up was buried in the day-to-day -day skirmishes with the range cattle. Action was something he understood. And he was unnatural at this business of cutting out spooky Mexican steers. In fact, the cowboy wasn't well enough acquainted with Injun Joe to know that this was no time to start a cigarette, because Joe would take out after a steer no matter what. And when did a fence mean anything to Injun Joe? Cowboy's life was tough enough without riding a jumper. And maybe that's what this horse should be. Injun Joe's owner agreed. The next day, Joe was taken to a place where he'd get a chance to jump. The nearby ranch of Colonel Anderson Norton. Colonel Norton, a retired cavalry officer, had an eye for a good horse. And he liked this one. Although the colonel had a reputation as an able horseman, he and many others recognized that it was his daughter, Sue, who had a singular quality, a certain special touch in training a jumper. A whole new phase of education started for Injun Joe as Sue led him beside a well-mannered, more experienced horse. She used side reins to keep his head in the right position. And Sue Norton began to teach him the basic things a jumper must know the carefully regulated stride between fences, the rhythmic approach, the unhurried acceptance of a series of obstacles. Soon, Sue felt that it was time to school him with weight on his back. Through all this, she was aided by her father as they carefully planned each succeeding stage of Injun Joe's training. Injun Joe had never carried a rider like this one. Her firm, gentle hands 
told him what she expected of him. The pressure of her legs and the subtle shifting of her weight reassured and helped him. But he wasn't an easy horse to train. Sometimes through youthful zeal, impatience, or most likely because he was Injun Joe, he decided to do it his own way. But power to be effective must be harnessed. And this occasioned some brisk passages between a willful horse and a skillful girl. Then one day, a couple from Virginia on a horse buying trip with their trainer saw the big yellow horse in action. The trainer agreed that here might be a prospect for the hunt field. It never occurred to Sue that these hunting people from Virginia would be interested in such an inexperienced jumper. But when they asked if he was for sale, she agreed to find out. Well, he was sold, and Injun Joe started to pack. The South Springs ranch outfit arrived to take him to the train. Now that the moment of departure had come, Injun Joe came into focus for Sue Norton. She was acutely aware of the raw talent that threatened to explode in all directions. And she felt more than ever his generosity and honesty. But she wondered if he would always find the extra understanding he needed to give his best. After the cow country of New Mexico, Injun Joe's new home in Virginia presented an entirely different way of life. Here, fox hunting is more than a pastime. It is an existence in itself, bound tightly to tradition, with a whole etiquette and set of customs of its own. Into this world bounded Injun Joe, already forgetting his recently interrupted schooling, as he realized that with this writer, he could have things his own way. Well-bred eyebrows raised at the sight of this unmannerly newcomer from the West. His conduct was so outrageous that even the hounds were nonplussed. fundamental rules of hunting demands that you never pass the master of foxhounds. But this was a nicety lost on Injun Joe. To him, the action of the hunt field was no different from a wild gallop across the New Mexico range. At the day's end, a well-bred hunter walks home sedately. But Injun Joe was neither sedate nor tired. As far as he was concerned, he was ready to start all over again. After a hunt, a flat-footed walk is expected and appreciated, but Injun Joe's incessant bounce was anything but a comfort to his rider. Injun Joe would never make a hunter, but his owners readily found a buyer who demanded only jumping ability in the horses he trained. To him, a horse was an article of merchandise. His business was to find horses with jumping ability, school them as quickly as possible, and sell them as show ring jumpers. At first, the horse took only a mild interest in the goings-on. But as he felt this new man studying him, a sense of dislike started building in him. The trainer knew that this man wasn't an ideal owner for a sensitive horse. 
but he had instructions to sell if the price was right. At first contact, Injun Joe boiled into resentment. But the man wasn't interested in what went on inside of Injun Joe. He had neither love nor respect for a horse. He was only interested in making a dollar. Injun Joe went on the defensive every time his new owner came near him. And his instincts were right, for the man met each resistance with unreasoning violence. Well, there was one way of fixing things so that the horse couldn't fight back. Just leave him alone and half starve him for a while. And so the months took their toll, and outwardly it looked as though the plan had worked. But inwardly, he was still Injun Joe. His owner was ready to carry on the warfare in earnest. This was a jumping horse stable where every horse had to earn his keep. And this man would make Injun Joe jump or else. The horse hadn't looked for this fight, but it was being brought to him, and he was perfectly willing to carry on. won the fight, but he lost it, too, because he was sold to a small riding academy where clumsy riders were the rule. If he hadn't earned his keep as a jumper, he was earning it now. Although he had nearly reached the bottom of the heap, underfed and overworked. It was still easy for Joe to flare into rebellion. And he lashed out at his existence by taking advantage of his riders. Joe made the ride at your own risk sign all too true. He was sold fast and cheap as a former jumper. And this time he came into the hands of a professional jumping horse rider. By now, Joe gave trouble to any rider whose will crossed his own. But this boy not only stayed with him, he actually reawakened in the horse the will to jump. Once again, the Palomino horse's natural jumping ability became apparent, and it caught the eye of a leading professional trainer. And so again, Injun Joe changed hands. This time, he had an owner who believed that conditioning was of prime importance, and food was the foundation. Joe couldn't have agreed with him more. And the bones disappeared beneath the rounded contours of a well-fed horse. The name of Injun Joe began to spread. It brought Hugh Wiley, a member of the United States equestrian team, to a small but important Eastern show. Wiley was searching for a jumper he could use on the team. And as he watched the Palomino, he recognized that although this was an inconsistent horse, he might have some of the qualities of an international jumper. Still, a nagging doubt perturbed him. News spreads rapidly in the horse world, and Hugh Wiley 
had heard of the ups and downs in Injun Joe's life. Like others before him, he felt the potential brilliance, but the question of how it might be developed bothered him. To dispel his doubts, there was Bert Denemothy, the coach of the equestrian team. A skilled trainer of jumpers, Denemothy had seen Injun Joe in action. He believed in the horse. His problems could be solved and Wiley was the rider to do it. So Injun Joe became a member of the United States Equestrian Team, the horses and riders who represent their country in international jumping competition. The team's training headquarters were in Greenwich, Connecticut. As a new door opened in Injun Joe's life, Hugh Wiley and Bert Denemothy agreed that there was something kind of likable about this crazy yellow horse. Now, Joe became the subject of meticulous care by a man whose quiet hands communicated skill and experience. Joe was curious about the amount of equipment necessary to take care of him. The whisker trimming wasn't too bad. But the business of having your ears worked on, well, that was something else again. The all-important care of his feet didn't bother him at all. But the trimming of his mane, although it wasn't painful, definitely tickled. There seemed to be no end to the attention that was lavished on him. And the whole thing was enough to make a horse laugh. A gray horse, Master William, was Hugh Wiley's number one horse. The previous year, he had won the coveted King George V Cup in London and had had a distinguished show record. Injun Joe may have been Wiley's second string horse, but Master William accepted him as an equal. The jumping squad of the United States equestrian team